Good morning. Well, I bring greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus. It's wonderful to be together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings. Lord, we look around us. We look even inside of us, so to speak, and we recognize your blessings. We recognize your presence. Lord, thank you also for the times when you chastise us, when your Holy Spirit uh, changes our direction if we're not going the direction you want us to. And I pray, God, that you would continue your work. I pray that you would give us uh, an internal uh, desire to serve you and also the peace when we do and when we uh, are going the direction and doing the things that you're asking, God, that we would enjoy that, that fellowship with you. So, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be together today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I give a welcome to each of you and a welcome to those who are listening online did you, everybody get up at 4 o'clock this morning and go out and, and enjoy the 42-degree weather? I didn't. <laughs> so I just saw on my phone that it was supposed to have been 42. I don't know, was it or not? I guess it was. Do you have any announcements to share this morning? Okay, Jonathan Hostetler has one. All right, I got two announcements. First of all, there's a sign-up sheet for meals for Marlon and Nancy Gingrich on the bulletin board. So if you can help fill that up and we can bless them with lightening their load in that way, that would be appreciated. Second of all, uh, number eight in your bulletin, you'll see is the men and boys camp out. That's this Friday night, Saturday forenoon or morning. Um, supper Friday night is at 6.30 and breakfast Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. Um, come for both. If you can't come for both, come for one or the other. So, thank you. Okay, and you notice in there it said the chimney is 12 inch by 12 inch. So you guys, if you're gonna build a chimney to burn, uh, LaRonda's got an announcement up front here, Verlin. Uh, 12 inch by 12 inch, it'll fit in that metal grate. So we have a lot of time, a lot of good times, you know, watching embers float. Okay, LaRonda. Just a reminder to you ladies that Tuesday evening is Rachel's bridal shower, so if we miss getting invi an invitation in your box, please let me know, but you're all invited for that, so it starts at 7 o'clock here in the Fellowship Hall Tuesday evening for the Pampered Chef and Tupperware party. Thank you. Okay. I did get the schedule for the Pleasant View services that our congregation will be asked to conduct and that would be on the third Sunday the first month of every quarter does that make sense so the rest of this year that will be starting in October because October is the first Sunday of the fourth quarter and then again January will be the first Sunday of the first quarter next month so the third Sunday of every quarter Sunnyside is asked to be in charge of the service at Pleasant View on and uh, at this point, at least, it's on a Sunday afternoon. Henry. Yeah, could you, could you just announce about the banquet that's coming up October the 2nd? Okay, we did find out this past week. The Gospel Echoes Banquet is on October the 2nd. Uh, we were, that was debatable for a while. We had put down October 2nd, and they do have a rally in Missouri. They finally got approval that that will happen, so our banquet will be scheduled as previously thought. So... It's on a Wednesday night. I uh, don't have the tickets yet. We don't have all the information or the flyers yet, but uh, hopefully we'll have them this week. So that's on a Wednesday. We plan to have communion the last Sunday of this month. I failed to get that in here too. Uh, we will have revival meetings the previous, it'll be ending the previous Sunday, so pray for Anthony. He and his wife, Nora, plan to come. Uh, she plans to come along, and so that would be from a Wednesday through a Sunday evening, and so our last service will be on a Sunday evening, uh, Lord willing. Is that all the announcements? Oh, the, uh, I think last week they have pie and ice cream too, this Friday evening at uh, Gospel Light, and I can't even remember the couple from Greece. Who? Fundraiser. Nick, who? Nick and Lisa. 
Okay, Nick and Lisa Bontrager are back from, from Greece, and so they're here. They're having a fundraiser uh, for them this Friday evening. When you think about God's organization, I'm going to just read from Genesis chapter 1, uh, one verse. And when I think about science, I read something in a fish wrapper about science, and I was just reminded how that when God set up uh, his creation, he did it so marvelously, so perfectly. And if I look in Genesis chapter 1, I guess I should read two verses. The last verse of chapter 1, the first verse of chapter 2. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Uh, and there was evening, and there was morning, the, third, the sixth day. And then verse 1. Thus the heaven and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And this is, it's not very long, but it, it makes you think a little bit. It's a little, it's, a, it's a little bit weighty. It's called laws and order. And it says, what is science? In its original form, science simply meant knowledge. Now, the denial of supernatural events limits the depths of understanding that science can have and the types of questions science can ask. I mean, if you deny God, if you deny the supernatural, what kind of questions can you ask? Although naturalistic science claims to be neutral and unbiased, it starts with this bias, that it has to be you know, neutral, it has to be unbiased, and, and that's a bias in itself. Making a distinction between operational or observable or observational science and historical or the origins, origins of science helps us understand the limitations of these naturalistic prepositions in science. So it's, uh, this was put out by Answers in Genesis. It just says the Bible is the foundation for science. Pretty profound. Uh, it's, and it's simple, but it's profound. Uh, it says non-Christians must borrow biblical ideas, such as orderly universe that, that obeys laws, in order to do science. If naturalism were true, if nature is all there is, then why should the universe have such order? Without the supernatural, there is no basis for logical, orderly laws of nature. So, do you remember what the second law of thermodynamics are, or is? Do things get better or do they get worse? <laughs> I mean, is it, you know, so when God sets it in order, it continues. Otherwise, it would just all fall apart. So it just, uh, you can praise God for his orderliness. Amen. Okay, I think we will look to Wendell for leading us in songs this morning. Good morning. It's a joy to be together this morning and to worship God. Our first two songs will be on the overhead. And as we sing these songs this morning, I've been struck this past week. How many places in scripture it talks about praising God? Isaiah 42, verse 10, the first part of the verse says, Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth. We are commanded to sing praises to God. That's, that's what we do in life. We praise our God. First song will be God is so good. And I know um, as we sing that, sometimes the ladies will have a hallelujah, kind of sung in the background as a nice touch to the song. I was just thinking about that. What does hallelujah mean? Praise the Lord. That's what we're doing. We're praising God. And so I invite you to join in us as or with us as we sing this morning praising God God is so good God is so
Jesus, we thank you that you are good, that you are our Lord, and we worship you and we praise you. May you be honored and glorified through our lives. You are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand at this time and uh, just turn to the people around you and bless them, greet them, and then we will start the next song, Remain Standing. I'm so glad I'm a part. Blessed Assurance, number 544 in the hymnal.
may be seated. Number 101 in the Spiral Bound Songbook is I've Been Changed, 101. last song will be number 60 in the same book. Breathe on me breath of God. Number 60. The song <laughs> takes a little bit different maybe approach than our last songs that we were singing about the salvation that God has given us. This song is a cry to God for him to continue to work in our lives to continue to sanctify us.
Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your presence, and that is our prayer, that you would continue to breathe on us. Uh, your breath, uh, give us that life that we need to live our lives abundantly for you. So I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This is our sharing time. What do you have to share this morning? Maybe this falls under the announcements. Number two, the Amos Raver family plans to sing at Fairview tonight at 630. Uh, we will continue to uh, plan for our prayer time for our missionaries as well. So I guess you'll have to decide uh, which place you go. And let's pray. Let's pray for our revival meetings. It's a week and a half till they start. So continue to pray for, for Anthony as he um, comes to share with us. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board. Did I mention that? If you want to host them for a meal, there's a few slots left there. You're welcome to do that. Okay, Martha? Recently, somebody asked me what my last song was that came through my mind. And this morning, the song dared me a Daniel, and our study is on it. And let's sing that. Okay. Verse 1. Standing by a Dare to have a purpose and make it known. Amen. That's, that's like evangelism. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes when uh, things come unexpected, you just take them in and go, and that's how it was last Friday. Uh, we left from here. We had a, a retreat with the leadership team, and then that afternoon, Char and I left for a funeral in Ohio. So it was Esther's stepmom and my stepmother-in-law. And she was 98 years old. Her name was Lizzie. And I'd known her for a long time. But the interesting thing was, as we were having the visitation, was that I am no blood relative. I'm there because of marriage and all that. And my wife, Char, was actually her great niece. So we had family from both sides, from the Miller side and the Yoder side there, and it was good. And then uh, on Sunday, they had the, the funeral Sunday morning at Sharon because Bethel, where she would have attended, is completely being redone and, and it was all tore up there, even though the, the service, was, the burial service was there. And so I was blessed after the funeral we went out there and they still do it pretty much so they have a funeral director and you can ask me about that but they don't use a funeral home and the body was put down into a wooden box covered with wood and then it was covered up with dirt and it was very dry out there in Holmes County right now so it's, the dirt was dry there was rock in it and um, what blessed my heart was that um, our grandchildren and a lot of Lizzie's or great grandchildren and grandchildren helped to put that dirt back in the hole. And I think it was a good way to just kind of complete the service. Um, they know where great grandma's body is and they understand as much as they can about heaven as well. So it was a good time and we came home on Monday then and didn't labor too much on that day. So. <laughs> I know some of you get Jared's updates, but last Sunday they sent out a new update. Um, anyway, they finished clearing their first field, and they didn't find any landmines, but they found 35 unexploded munitions. And those, they, if they were safe, they moved them 
to the side of the field. Otherwise, they would tie a rope to them and pull them to the side of the field, and then um, somebody in the country, the government, came and either blew them up right there or removed them and blew them up. They also got their tractor um, the week before, so like two weeks ago, and so they're figuring out how to remotely drive that tractor and Jared sent a picture of it going down the field and it's a little freaky to watch this field or this tractor go down the field and you realize there is nobody sitting in there and it comes to the end and you're like, is it gonna know how to stop and turn around? But it did. And um, so anyway, so they're pretty excited about those things moving forward. Um, but yeah, I guess I realized maybe more than ever the danger that it is when Jared and Rollin go through these fields looking for landmines and anything that isn't exploded and their prayer is is that they would find everything because if they don't and the tractor hits it with the disc it will blow it up and so then they start over and um, I guess this is a new thing that is just being done to figure out how to remotely drive these tractors and so there's some bugs that need to be worked out and and all of that but um, overall I know it's exciting for them to actually be doing what they went to do um, sometime soon they're going to be going to Romania and getting their visas um, they thought they were going to go this weekend and then that didn't work out for them so she's not sure when Rolanda said she's not sure when they'll get to go for that um, then on another note, uh, a couple weeks ago, our family went on vacation, and as we were driving down the interstate, once I hit about 70 miles an hour, my van started just a, a slight vibration, and I could feel it in the steering, and I'm like, oh boy, now what? Do I worry about it? Do I just keep going? What do I do? Well, Nate and Rosie weren't too far behind us, and so they caught up with us, and he watched it from the back and from the side and everything else, and he said, I think you're good to go, and so I did. On the way home was the same thing, and I just kept praying. I said, God, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand vehicles, and this is new to me to have to think about this. But anyway, um, I did, after a couple of weeks, I talked to Kelowna Auto Sales where we get our service work done and told them and the boys thought it was probably just some dirt in the tire and so that was all that it was so I just kind of kept driving and last week when I took it in for them to check it out I found out my two front tires were bad and one of them the belt had slipped and that's what was causing it and this morning, I just thank God for taking care of us, that we did not have a flat tire going 70 miles an hour down the interstate. God is good. You know, and my prayer is that even if we would have had a flat tire, that I could still spin and say this morning, God is good. Amen. God is good, Rhoda. I had a flat tire. <laughs> not a 70 mile an hour, no. <laughs> If you'll notice on uh, Missionaries of the Month, Lloyd and Joyce Beachy, <coughs> thinking about this, they uh, plan to go to a conference in Greece in October. And so they want to go to Turkey before they go to Greece, if they can. So let's pray that they can get their visas uh, for that. I think at one time they may have been asked to leave uh, without necessarily an invitation to come back. Uh, well, it, that would have been t Turkey. And so uh, this, they were just wanting us to pray with them about that. And you'll notice uh, they have two very old neighbors who lived in their former apartment buildings. So one of them, I think, is 100, and another one is 98, if I remember right. And so their family relations with their, with their children and all are not good. They have strained relations, uh, either or else none. And so uh, their prayer is that these people would find Jesus. They're older, and uh, they don't have a lot of time. So then in the third one, was uh, he says that many of their the co-workers there uh, are discouraged. They're weary. So let's pray that 
that they could find strength in the Lord. And he's been asked, Lloyd's been asked to provide online teaching on spiritual formation. And so as he tries to do that in a way that's encouraging and helpful, uh, we appreciate our prayers as well. Anyone else? Nancy's not doing as well. How's she doing this morning, Marlon? Not so well this morning. So let's keep her in our prayers. So um, just remember remember her. And uh, it was mentioned earlier there's a sign-up sheet for meals. So I know I had said something, I don't know, it's been two or three months ago, Marlon asked, you know, how, you know, we had an anointing service for her. Uh, it's been two years ago? How long has it been? Yeah, you know, and, and so the Lord has been good, and uh, God has given her life and given her, I felt like, a fairly fairly good life, and then right now she's struggling, so just keep her in your prayers. Let's pray for Marlon, too. Okay, I invite you to stand. Uh, some of you might want to just gather around Marlon. Let's pray for him and Nancy right now. Uh, someone lead out in that. And then someone else pray for Lloyd and Joyce as Missionaries of the Month, some of the things that they're dealing with as, as well. helping people that have needed help after disasters. I pray that you would just bless them with good days. I pray for Nancy. Thank you for her approach to this cancer and just being um, very much low-key about it and willing to, to um, kind of endure whatever came her way. And I pray that you would bless her with a good day with the we do pray for your will to be accomplished in the healing process and that you would guide and direct both her and Marlon in this, in Jesus' name. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you that even in the hard times, the tough times, we can, we can find our strength in you. We can be very real with both of them, especially in the bad days. And uh, Lord, that we can also enjoy those good days. Someone want to pray for Lloyd and Joyce? I invite you to lead out. Thank you, Father, for those from this congregation you've called to mission work. Father, they're scattered in different places doing different things, Lord, and I pray that you would continue to call. Uh, use this congregation, God, to continue to, to go out, and I pray, God, that you would lead up those and raise up those and uh, 
Give them the strength and, and the direction they need in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I invite Floyd to come. <clears throat> Lord, give us, give us something to feed on this morning from your word that would uh, be edifying, something that would, be, uh, would cause us to grow. And Lord, like physical food is good for us and we need it. We need your word. We need your Holy Spirit. So I pray that you would anoint Floyd as he shares with us now in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. Do the higher elevation, it's warmer up here than down there, so... It's a blessing to be here, and it's a blessing to have you be a part of the, the reading of God's Word this morning, uh, which is coming out of Matthew chapter 7. And after that, I would like to have us sing that children's song, The Wise Man Built His House Upon the Rock. And I was trying to think of how it went when I was in my study, and I kept thinking about the foolish man and trying to start the song that way, and it didn't work, so it's better to start with it the way it is. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. We sing that song. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rain came tumbling down. The rain came down as the floods came up. The rain came down as the floods came up. What happens in your life when the blessings don't always seem to be coming down? And that is kind of what my, my message is targeting uh, 
I would have titled the message, Our Foundation, the Eternal Rock, and that's kind of wordy and it's kind of long. And it could be just Our Foundation. But kind of the theme verse this morning is Hebrews 13.8. It says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Could you repeat that with me? Jesus Christ the same yesterday forever. Amen. I'm doing yesterday, okay? But it is the same today, and it will be that way forever. But our foundation, and this is foundational, are there, I know there are builders here. I know there are different ones uh, from the leadership team alone that are builders and others how important is a foundation? Is it pretty important? Very important? Yeah, it is. It's very, very important. I don't think a house is any better than where and what it is resting on. And so I think you could have a solid foundation out in the middle of the ocean. I don't think that would be a good thing either. Although there are things that are built out in the ocean. Story is told of a young lady that was learning the art of making pottery, and she loved making pottery. What she didn't like, in fact, she said it was boring, was getting the clay ready. And so I, I just looked it up. I didn't have a clue. I, I'm not a potter. I don't do that. And if those of you that do and have know this already, but there are at least seven steps to getting the clay ready, and then that is for wet clay for making pottery. And it takes a lot of time, and she called it boring. Okay, have any of your children ever say they were bored with something? Or have you ever said, this is boring, standing in line for an hour? Yeah, that's boring. And she discovered she could make pottery without doing all those at least seven steps. And she could turn out some beautiful things, um, detailed things like mugs and candle holders and egg cups and bowls and plates and kind of use your imagination. I've seen pottery made into looking like a frog or something like that. So she discovered she could make all those beautiful things without going through all those boring steps. And then she put the pottery or the clay into the kiln, into a drying oven, a heated oven. I, I'm not, I don't know how hot they are, but they're very hot. And guess what? They would explode. And so she had to go back to do everything step by step the way that she was told to do it, boring as it was. And that's kind of how we are with our foundation. Sometimes it doesn't seem very, very fun to have a solid foundation, but you must have one in life. And so it must be with our religion as well. Christianity is a religion. Um, years ago, there was a bumper sticker that said WWBD, and it meant, what would Buddha do? Well, guess what? Buddha died, so that's it. He, he's not doing anything. He's just dead. And if there was a real Buddha, he's beyond just being dead. He's also, I believe, in torment. But it, we have had these bumper stickers. What would Jesus do? And that's correct, because Jesus lives. And we need to embrace Jesus Christ as foundation. That's always was, always will be. That is an eternity. We should be able to wrap our brains, our minds, our thinking, our logic around Jesus Christ before we give him our heart. I don't think it should just be because somebody talked us into it. I think we should count the cost. I think we should look at, is this really true? And I believe with all of my heart that it is. Illustrate. People by the million have embraced secular humanism. It was a popular word 20 years ago. 
And I don't read about it near like I did then, but I believe that people are living as secular humanists, probably more so in this time than ever before. No one is wrong. Everything is relative, and if it feels good, it should be done. If it doesn't feel so good, you probably shouldn't do it. Kind of living by the golden rule even, some really good thoughts. All roads lead to heaven. Your way, my way, anyway, we are all good, except those that have an absolute way, like only through Jesus, only through Yeshua, only through the one way. If you want to rile up someone that's, that believes that way, you tell them that there's only one way. And here's the irony. Everything is relative, creates an absolute. And that is a huge contradiction because people that believe that way don't want absolutes. They want everything to be relative. Your mind and my mind must embrace truth. That is foundational. We are not true. It says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know our hearts? The next verse gives the answer. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins or our minds. Wow. He sees if we are in alignment, if we really are practicing what we say we believe. Otherwise, we walk crooked. And our path can be straight sometimes, and sometimes it veers off to the left or to the right. And God is truth. So search if you must, if you're still searching. And I think we have searched, and I think that's why we're here this morning. But just a reminder, if we search for truth, it will lead you to an eternal rock. And that is a foundational truth. Deuteronomy 33, 27, it says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He always was and he always will be. Nothing else, I believe, on the face of this earth meets that criteria. Our souls will live eternally somewhere. But we had a beginning. You and I had a beginning. Everything we can comprehend with our senses, our taste, our touch, our hearing, our smell, our sight, all had a beginning, and for my mother-in-law, last week, they came to an end in that physical body. We could see it, but it, nothing was happening there. I accept that by faith, based on the truth of God's word. And that's my basis for Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ being the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'd like to have us turn to Matthew chapter 16. Very much goes with the lesson and the message. I'd like to start reading from verse 13 through the end. And I wondered if we could stand for this. If we could stand up for reading Matthew 16, if you're able and don't mind. Starting in verse 13, Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? I thought that was an interesting way to word it. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Could we say that together? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Let me read that part of that again. And be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You may be seated. Thank you for that. A couple of things that we must know in this passage. The first one was, Thou art Peter, means Petros, masculine, rock, as Jesus would have used it for Peter. And then he goes on and he says that, let me just find out, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, and that's Petros, with an R-A-S ending instead of R-O-S. And it is feminine. And so there's two different words, and they mean two different things. And he said, I will build, that's future tense, that means in the, past, in the future, I will build. So in my opinion, my belief is that Jesus was using Peter's name as a metaphor, as kind of an example for himself, for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation, the eternal rock that his future bride, feminine, the church, will be built on. If you insist it must be Peter, Peter would be a contradiction from the masculine to the feminine. So it's, those are words that you can easily look up in a strong concordance, and you can see Petrus, and you can see, or Petra, and you can also see the first word for Peter, meaning rock, and it's masculine. And Peter isn't eternal. And he wasn't a good foundation. Peter was a man, like you and I are. He changed his mind sometimes, and he did things kind of impulsively, and yet God miraculously gave him God the Holy Spirit to live in him and guide him and direct him, and he was a great apostle. So Jesus was making a transition here from and explaining how it was going to happen, and he was very clear on how it was going to happen. So the question I have for us to think about this morning is, who was the church back then? And it was the children of Israel. That was God's chosen people. Who was going to be the church in the future? Think about that as well. You are, if you look around, you're looking at part of that assembly of the church of Jesus Christ. It was going to be everyone, Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female, it didn't matter, that would embrace Jesus Christ as their Savior. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting, eternal life. And he was trying to explain this to his followers and his disciples and how this was all going to happen. In verse 21, they, especially Peter, but I think all of them, didn't fully understand or grasp what he was telling them. There are times when our hearts may get in the way of our heads happened to me way too many times. I have a heart for something, but my head says, no, it can't be that way. And that's the problem with relativism. The heart says, you do it your way, that's okay. 
I'll do it my way, that's okay. No, it's not. There's only one way. It's not through ourselves. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is what Jesus was trying to tell the disciples. For this church aid to be ushered in, he would have to die. Their master, their teacher, their friend was telling them, I will need to die. And that was huge in their minds, and they were saying, no, Jesus. And you can't say, no, Jesus. Did they hear him say he would be raised from the dead, come to life? Either they didn't understand or they didn't believe. And I don't know, maybe it was a combination of both of those. But Jesus made it very clear to Peter that this was his not wanting it to happen was from the enemy. Peter was listening to the wrong spirit. Get behind me, Satan. Sounds extremely harsh. I don't think there's a brother or sister in this room that I would want to say that to. And yet Jesus was very clear in saying to Peter, get behind me, Satan. If Jesus hadn't died, we would remain in our sins. If he hadn't raised again, we would not serve a living Savior. He is alive. Hallelujah. Amen. And then we usher in the New Testament church. And imagine the transition of yesterday's church becoming the new church. New converts. A new dispensation which we know all about because we have the New Testament, but they didn't. A new group. There would be new leaders. There would be new ways to worship. There would even be a new diet. Behold, all things are become new is speaking about the life of a believer, but it's also applying to the New Testament church. So for all of that, they had to have a solid foundation, and they did because it was a church based on the belief in a living, eternal God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me abbreviate. Truth is good, and truth is God's word. Love is John 3.16. It points to Jesus. Holiness is the life of every believer. Wendell talked about being sanctified this morning. It's a life of holiness, of of getting more and more and more like Jesus instead of going the other way. From the head to the heart, it must permeate our very being, our deeds and our actions. Have I failed? Absolutely. But Jesus fulfilled these things perfectly. So God is eternal. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's both merciful and just. And he, he does that perfectly. He is truth. He is love. He is holy. I can't put it into a nutshell because there's no nutshells that are big enough to put God into. He is too vast. He is everywhere. Is anyone here going to change God? A question for you to think about. Are you going to change God? No. Am I going to change God? Absolutely not. Anyone, anywhere, is anyone big enough, strong enough, wealthy enough, powerful enough to change God? And the answer is absolutely not. No, no way. How about Satan? The angel of pride and deception. No, no, no. He did not ever and will never change who God is. So if we're not in any way going to change God... What had to happen in the New Testament church as well as now? And the answer is obvious. He must change us. We're not going to change him. He must change us. Change can be painful. We all know that. It may take some time. If we are going to go through life with meaning and purpose and security, 
then it must be God in us leading us. I'd like to have us reflect on this past year. Did you ever have days you didn't want to get up in the morning? The day I had looked pretty dreary, pretty meaningless, and all of us can have and will have those days at times. We need God in us, guiding us not only through the good times, but most certainly through the tough times. The struggle of the early church was that their foundational belief, the one God made up of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy and Dwelling Spirit was their foundation. But, and it's the same for us today, they still had to deal with people, with each other. In Acts, it records the struggles of beliefs and values. Men and women were being used mightily of God. You have Pentecost happening. The early church growth was just like an explosion. So many believers coming in one day and being baptized. They had all things in common. They just shared their wealth. Peter and John, working with the tension of Judaism, were, they had this belief that God had set up, and now they were being asked to embrace Jesus Christ and the things that he taught. There was a new dispensation. You had the stoning of Stephen. You have Paul coming on the scene. Him and Barnabas used mightily the Holy Spirit leading them and guiding them powerfully. Miracles took place, things that couldn't be explained other than to say that was a miracle. People were saved. Hallelujah. I'd like to have us turn to Acts chapter 15. They came up with a covenant for the Gentile believers. Verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. It was kind of a covenant that they came up with. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. It's a good, good thing to remember for all of us. It's the only way that we're going to have true salvation is through our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and our willingness to give our lives up to him. And beliefs and values combined in verse 20, it says, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. They kept it simple. Back in my school days, we had this thing called KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. So they weren't stupid, but they kept it simple, all right? They didn't have any letters from Paul to the Romans, from Paul to the Corinthians, to Colossians, Ephesians, and all the others, First and Second Peter, like we have today. They had something that was relevant for their day going back to the Israel being taught by God how they should do things and now they have come up with this statement and again it says that you abstain from meats offered to idols wouldn't mean a lot to us today and from blood that does mean something for us today and from things strangled but there's a lot of input and importance put on things that we wouldn't consider necessarily that important. And from fornication, and that covers a whole gamut of living together, of, of sex before marriage, and a lot of different things. Adultery, from which if ye you keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. I thought that was good for the day that they were in. And then if you go to verses 36 through 41, 
you find out that they also had to deal with people. Kind of like us today. We have to deal with each other. Sometimes we have to deal with unhandy things and maybe sometimes unhandy situations. 36 through 41 I'd like to read. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. So he had a reason. Verse 39, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. You can read into this whatever you want, but you have two men of God, both with good reason to disagree about John Mark. Barnabas, who I believe was also his uncle, wanted to give him another chance. Paul said, no, nope, no way. It doesn't say that either one of them sinned. It just said they had a contention that they were disagreeing. And I'm not standing, and I don't think any of us are standing in judgment here today this morning and saying they should have found a way to agree together. I don't know that. Paul later had kind words for John Mark in the scripture and I believe that two teams were formed. The gospel moved on. The Holy Spirit continued to work and later I believe that God the Holy Spirit inspired Peter, or Paul, inspired Paul to write, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's in Philippians 2, 3. You have belief, you have values, and you have the eternal rock, and that's what their foundation was. So in conclusion... Some questions to think about. Where does sin enter the picture when values and beliefs clash long enough? When you are no longer on the foundation is when I believe that sin can enter in. I believe as long as we have a solid foundation, if we have the eternal rock in our lives, and we go to him and we ask him to guide us every day, I think we're on safe territory. So I believe that sin comes in when we don't have that foundation, when we don't have that belief. You're no longer on the foundation. What I'm asking is that we personalize this message. If you have secret sins, they aren't. Is the Jesus Christ of yesterday our foundation today? He is if he is our eternal rock. Because he said upon this rock I will build my church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being the eternal rock, our foundation, the God of, of eternity, past. God that had no beginning will have no end. We know that you're here this morning. We know that your word reaches into our hearts no matter where we're at, no matter how we're doing in life. So I pray that your word would continue to engage us with thinking, with thoughts of how we are doing, of not lining up with other people but with you. So I pray that you would guide and direct and bless 
your word this morning as it was spoken and I pray that everything would have been done for your own honor and your own glory we pray in Jesus name amen I'd like to turn the time over to the Sunday school superintendent I want to welcome each one to the Sunday School Hour. Our offering today, for the main offering, is for our ministers, and the Sunday School offering is for EBI. So let's pray. We thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you for the beautiful weather we had outside today. We thank you for the uh, uh, blessings that you've given us, and that we can meet together here in peace and quiet with no fear. We want to thank you for our ministers and for the work that they do for us, and we pray that you will use this offering to bless them. And we want to pray for EBI and for uh, Thaddeus, who's there, and that uh, the offering that we've taken for them can be a blessing to them as well. Be with us as we study our lessons and be with our teachers as they lead us. And these things do we ask in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. If you, um, if you look in your bulletin, it is um, number one uh, in the announcements section. Um, I'm going to just tell you a little bit more about that. I have a paper here, so um, it's a, it'll be an alternative Bible study um, that anybody who wants can uh, be a part of, and it's about um, the history of the Anabaptist movement. So I'm just going to read you a couple of sentences here that is highlighted. Um, in January 1525, a small group of believers met in Zurich and baptized one another, making the beginning of the Anabaptist movement. The 500th anniversary of that event is coming up in 2025. And then here's a little bit about the course. The course shows both the weaknesses and strengths in the history of the Anabaptists. The study guide is designed to be accessible to youth and adults. So anybody who's interested in that, um, when we come around and count classes and stuff, or if you just want to talk to me or Jonathan or whoever, um, I think you said by next Sunday we should know or so, Marvin. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to say that. Starting in December. December, yeah. So, yeah, so anybody who's interested, uh, just let us know as soon as you can, and then we'll take care of it. So, okay. Uh, the children in the superintendent to the basement can be dismissed, and the teachers. Our lesson today um, is titled Witnessing to Authorities, and uh, it's uh, about the uh, account of Daniel. When uh, the writing is on the wall, you know, the old saying, the handwriting's on the wall. So there's a lot of stuff I could say, but um, I think that I'll just keep it kind of short since I talked a while now. But Daniel is a really good example for us. I feel like especially in the times that we live in now because, you know, 100 years ago or so, whether they were or not, a lot more people pretended to be Christians at the very least than they do now. And so... There's a lot more chances to be not only a witness, but a brave witness in the face of potential persecution in the age that we live in. So I'll leave you with that, and may God bless you as you study your lesson. Go now.